Oppenheimer might seem like a straightforward biopic, but there's a surprising reason for the black and white moments in the film. Be warned, there are spoilers ahead. Oppenheimer tells the story of the man behind the world's most deadly invention, but in true Christopher Nolan fashion, the movie is presented in a confusing, non-linear way. Much like in Nolan's earlier film Memento, black and white scenes are inserted among colored ones. But unlike Memento, the use of color in Oppenheimer isn't to make the timeline easier to understand. So why the constant back and forth? Well, to make sense of Nolan's confusing choice, we must first understand the true order of the film's events, and the important elements that the black and white scenes have in common. The earliest chronological point in the film is also one of the first scenes shown, taking place during J. Robert Oppenheimer's time at Cambridge University around 1925. After almost poisoning his professor Snow White style, Oppenheimer journeys abroad to study quantum physics, meeting fellow Jewish-American theorist Isidore Rabi along the way. Later on, during Rabi's testimony at Oppenheimer's rigged security hearing with the Atomic Energy Commission, he states they met in 1928. After teaching at the California Institute of Technology and UC Berkeley, Oppenheimer is officially hired as director of the Manhattan Project by Leslie Groves, the character played by Matt Damon. According to his testimony in the film, this occurred in 1942, the same year Oppenheimer apparently made his last contribution to the anti-fascist fighting in the Spanish Civil War. Additionally, when AEC special counsel Roger Robb reveals that Oppenheimer may have inadvertently perjured himself recalling his conversation with Boris Pash, his attorney states that the conversation was had 12 years ago. That roughly places the interaction in 1942 as well. In the years that follow Oppenheimer's hiring on the Manhattan Project, events are relatively clear in their order. In 1943, Oppenheimer meets with Florence Pugh's Jean Tatlock. She died in January of the following year in real life, but Nolan moves it up a few months to come inside with Niels Bohr early Christmas party. The film accurately maintains the July 16th Trinity test date in 1945, as well as the August 6th date of Hiroshima's bombing. Robert Downey Jr.'s Louis Strauss enters the picture, though. Events get harder to keep track of. As stated in the film, Strauss and Oppenheimer met on the Princeton University campus in 1947. Historically, the incident in which Oppenheimer humiliated him in front of the General Advisory Committee occurred two years later. The closed-door, round-table meeting in which Strauss, Oppenheimer, and several other members of the military and scientific communities discuss a response to Soviet nuclear advancement is harder to pin down. It's seemingly a reimagining of the Oppenheimer panel meetings that occurred between 1952 and 1953. But at the same time, it addresses the first Soviet atomic bomb test, which occurred in August of 1949. In the film, it does appear that the scene takes place in 1949. The newspaper announcing President Truman's embrace of the hydrogen bomb program places Strauss's reveal of Klaus Fuchs' betrayal sometime in 1950. Oppenheimer's AEC security hearing took place in 1954, while Strauss's Senate confirmation hearing took place five years later. So what does all this have to do with the movie's use of color? You might have noticed that Oppenheimer himself appears in every scene of the film, except for some of the black and white ones. This has less to do with the timeline and more to do with perspective. I wrote the script in the first person. It's the only time I've done that. It made it clear to anyone who read the script that we're on this ride with Oppenheimer. While the scenes in color are supposed to be depictions of events as seen from Oppenheimer's eyes, the black and white ones are all from Louis Strauss's point of view. This can definitely be confusing at times, but once you understand exactly what's going on, it makes the story even more rewarding. In three hours, Oppenheimer dramatizes more than three decades of history. Needless to say, it's easy to get lost in time every once in a while.